What if I told you that the most reliable shelters ever created by human hands were not built of stone, wood, or steel? They were made of living earth, cut from the soil like the flesh of a giant. And what if these shelters preserved life through winters so ferocious that even modern Alaskans would find them unendurable? Today, we step inside the forgotten engineering of the North Atlantic Vikings, the people who learned to build houses so storm-proof, so insulated, and so perfectly adapted to a sub-Arctic hell that many still stand after 1,000 years. But behind these dwellings lies a secret that archaeologists are only now beginning to understand. When the first Norse settlers stepped onto Icelandic soil around AD 870, they entered a world no saga had ever prepared them for. The wind here didn't simply blow, it screamed, slashing across the open landscape with a force capable of peeling skin. Volcanic ash hung in the air like a permanent storm, coating clothing, tools, and lungs. And winter, winter swallowed the daylight whole. Days collapsed into a dim twilight where even fire felt tiny. But the cruelest surprise came from what was missing. No forests, no groves, no towering trunks to carve into beams, walls, or rafters, the very materials that define the soul of Viking architecture. For a people raised in great wooden halls, arriving in Iceland was akin to dropping modern builders onto the surface of the moon and asking them to construct a house. Nothing worked the way they expected. Nothing obeyed the rules they knew. Yet the Vikings did not turn back. They would not let the land break them. Instead, they watched the wind, they studied the soil, and slowly, piece by piece, they adapted, not through force, but through a rare kind of humility. They let the land teach them how to survive. What the settlers eventually noticed was so simple and quiet that it seemed impossible they had overlooked it. The ground beneath their feet wasn't just soil. It wasn't mud or dirt or waste. It was alive, not poetically, but literally, a dense weave of roots packed layers of organic matter. Moisture was locked between centuries of growth and decay. Icelandic turf was a natural composite built by cold winds and freezing seasons. It flexed, it breathed, it held warmth like living skin. To people desperate for shelter, this became a revelation. Archaeologists studying turf layers today have discovered something astonishing. In certain conditions, these ancient earthen walls insulate as well as modern fiberglass. And unlike wood, turf didn't rot quickly. It didn't warp in a storm. It didn't vanish if a ship carrying timber failed to arrive on schedule. In the brutal North Atlantic, it was a miracle material. Free, abundant, sustainable, and available everywhere. But the Vikings understood that discovery alone wasn't enough. A miracle is useless without mastery. What they needed wasn't just turf. They needed engineering, a way to turn living earth into architecture strong enough to outlast storms, centuries, and time itself. Turf houses were not crude huts thrown together in desperation. They were deliberate, methodical, almost surgical works of engineering. Builders began by carving the earth with long-handled spades, tools designed to slice through soil the way a chef cuts through a massive loaf of bread. Each slice lifted from the ground became a block, thick, dense, and heavy, shaped into what the Norse called turf bricks. These blocks weren't stacked randomly. They were arranged in interlocking patterns, often a herringbone weave, where every angle was chosen to distribute weight and prevent collapse. Layer after layer, the walls grew thicker. Some reached six feet across, massive fortifications of living earth. Only when these walls stood firm did the builders introduce wood, but not in the way most people imagine Viking construction. Iceland had no forests to cut, no endless supply of timber waiting to be harvested. So settlers turned to one of the strangest supply chains in history, the Arctic driftwood system. Huge logs, torn from the coasts of Siberia and North America, rode ocean currents for thousands of miles before washing up on Iceland shores. When the Vikings found them, it was like discovering treasure. Each log was precious, reserved only for what truly required wood, beams, rafters, tools, the skeleton of the home. Everything else, every wall, every corridor, every insulated chamber, was built from earth, to survive Iceland's knife-sharp winds. 
the Vikings did something bold and counterintuitive. They built downward. Instead of rising above the land, their homes sank into it, half submerged like ancient creatures burrowing for warmth. This half subterranean design wasn't an aesthetic choice. It was survival engineering. By lowering the structure, they reduced the amount of wall exposed to the relentless North Atlantic storms. Winds that could peel roofs off wooden halls in Norway struggled to find anything to attack here. The earth itself became a shield, but wind protection was only the first advantage. The soil around the walls acted as a natural thermal battery, holding a steady temperature even as the outside world froze, thawed, and froze again. Instead of fighting the climate, the Vikings used the planet's own stability to their benefit. And there was more. A house wedged into the earth could not be torn away no matter how violently a winter storm tried. The storm rages, but the land grips the house, anchors it, protects it. Archaeologists often compare these structures to fox dens, narrow entrances leading into deep, insulated interiors with floors that slope gently downward to trap warmth and push cold air away. The Vikings weren't just building shelters, they were learning to vanish into the landscape itself, letting the earth swallow their homes for safety. They didn't conquer the land, they merged with it. Beneath every turf wall, hidden from sight, the Vikings built something most visitors never notice. A stone foundation so deliberate that archeologists now call it the spine of the house. It wasn't decorative, it was survival. Heavy stones were placed in a tight, purposeful layer, creating a barrier between the damp Icelandic soil and the living turf stacked above it. Without this stone base, moisture would creep upward softening the walls until they sagged and collapsed. With it, the turf stayed dry, firm, and structurally sound. The spine also acted as a natural drainage system. Rain, meltwater, and ground moisture filtered slowly through the cracks between stones instead of pooling against the walls. It was passive engineering done centuries before anyone used that term. A design meant to fight rot without tools, pumps, or maintenance, what is astonishing is how long these stone spines endured. In some archaeological digs, the turf has completely vanished. Yet the stones remain exactly where Viking hands placed them, still aligned, still forming the ghostly outline of homes built a thousand years ago. It is the skeleton of a vanished architecture, a foundation designed not just to survive the climate the Vikings knew, but the volcanic winters, shifting soils, and unpredictable future they sensed was coming. This was not primitive building. This was engineering meant to outlast time. The most iconic part of a Viking turf house wasn't its walls. It was the roof, a curved, sloping mass of earth that looked less like something built and more like something grown. Builders started with a skeleton of wooden rafters where each piece was precious. Each log was carefully chosen from the limited driftwood that washed ashore. They layered birch bark across the beams, a natural waterproof membrane used for centuries across the north. And then came the turf. Thick slabs of grass and soil were laid like overlapping shingles, heavy, damp, and alive. But the real transformation happened long after the builders left. The roof didn't simply sit there, it changed. Grass sprouted fresh each spring. Moss crept across the slopes like a slow-moving tide. Roots pushed downward into the rafters, knitting themselves into the structure until the house and the hill became one continuous organism. To an outsider approaching a farmstead, the buildings could seem invisible, just gentle rises in the landscape with a single wooden door breaking the illusion. It looked like the earth itself had opened a seam. But this wasn't camouflage. It wasn't a trick of style or a romantic choice. It was survival engineering at its highest form, a roof that insulated, protected, regenerated, and anchored the home against storms that could flatten almost anything else built in the North Atlantic. A living shield, a growing shelter, a rooftop that didn't just endure the landscape, it joined it. Inside these dark, insulated rooms, the hearth was more than a fire. It was the center of life, the single unwavering pulse that kept an entire household alive through Icelandic winters. Viking homes were dim by design. Low ceilings pressed the heat downward. Windows were narrow slits built small to keep out the storms. And from the fire pit, smoke drifted upward in heavy, slow-moving layers, curling along the rafters before finding any place to escape. 
People slept on raised wooden benches lining the walls, seats during the day, beds at night, their bodies arranged in tight proximity around the fire. Family members, visitors, hired workers, even travelers taken in during a storm. Everyone shared the same hall. In a land where the cold outside could crack bone and steal breath, the warmth inside these walls could feel like being reborn. Here, life compressed into a single glowing center. Meals were cooked, stories were told, tools were repaired, arguments whispered, and children were lulled to sleep by the rhythm of crackling flame. But the hearth brought more than comfort. It brought a second, quieter threat. The very design that trapped heat trapped smoke as well. Ventilation was a constant battle. Opening a vent during a storm risked extinguishing the fire or letting in drifting snow. Closing it meant long hours of breathing smoke that stung the eyes and scratched the lungs. Inside these homes, warmth and danger lived side by side. The fire gave life, but surviving it was its own test. Turf houses excelled at holding warmth better than almost any early structure in the North Atlantic, but the same insulation that protected families from lethal cold created another danger, one far quieter and far harder to escape. Smoke. During the worst winter storms, opening a vent was an active risk. A single gust could snuff out the fire, plunging the home into freezing darkness. Another gust could send snow drifting straight inside, coating floors, bedding, and food stores in minutes. So, families kept the vents closed. Hours turned into days, days into months. And over time, the air inside these homes thickened, not with choking smoke, but with a low, constant haze. The kind that burns the eyes slowly, irritates the throat, and settles into the lungs with every breath. Archaeologists today see the proof. Interior beams from excavated longhouses are soaked in soot, darkened by years of trapped smoke. And skeletal remains from Viking Age Icelanders show markers that may point to chronic respiratory stress, a physical signature of generations living in homes that warmed and suffocated them in the same breath. The turf houses kept them alive. They shielded them from storms that could kill within minutes. They held heat when the outside world felt like a frozen void. But survival always comes with a price. And for these early settlers, the cost was measured not in battles or winters, but in every breath drawn inside those living, smoking walls. A Viking turf homestead was never just a single building. It was an entire ecosystem, a cluster of rooms, halls, and workspaces woven together like organs in a living body. At the center stood the longhouse, the warm communal heart where families slept, talked, and survived the winter. Nearby lay the dairy room, chilled by design, lined with wooden tubs and stone shelves for storing milk, butter, and skyre. A pantry held dried fish, smoked lamb, and precious grains. Animal stalls were built close enough that the heat of livestock, sheep, goats, and sometimes cattle helped warm the surrounding rooms. There were weaving rooms where women spun wool into thread, tool rooms where iron and driftwood were shaped into the implements of daily survival and small guest chambers reserved for winter travelers who might die if turned away. These spaces were connected by enclosed passages or built so tightly together that even in a whiteout blizzard, a person could move from one building to the next without losing their way or freezing mid-step. In a land where the weather could erase pathways within minutes, this design wasn't convenience. It was life or death. Every farm became a miniature world, a self-contained civilization hidden beneath layers of grass, snow, and volcanic ash. A place where dozens of tasks, roles, and rhythms played out under one interconnected roof system. And yet, for all their complexity, these homes shared a strange uniformity. From the outside, they all resembled low grassy mounds with wooden doors, nearly indistinguishable from one another. A thousand years ago, entire communities could disappear into the landscape and look almost exactly the same, out of necessity. In Scandinavia, wealthy Jarls announced their status through architecture, towering wooden halls, carved beams, imported timber, and bright painted gables. Their power was visible long before they ever spoke, but in Iceland that system collapsed the moment people arrived. Here, everyone lived beneath turf. Chieftains, farmers, craftsmen, warriors, all sheltered under the same low, grass-covered mounds. From a distance, their homes were nearly indistinguishable. A doorway in the earth, a sloping roof of living green, and walls built from the same handfuls of soil. Inside, differences existed. A prosperous household owned more livestock, more tools, more land. But from the outside, from the angle the landscape showed to the world, hierarchy flattened. The storm did not care who you were. The wind made no room for pride. The cold erased the visual markers of wealth. Under turf roofs, everyone looked equal. 
In death, social class re-emerged. Burials were rich with symbols, swords, beads, carved stones, imported luxury goods. But in life, the environment forced a kind of equality that no king, council, or law code had ever achieved. Some historians argue this quiet architectural shift changed Icelandic society more than any saga admits. A leveling of status built not by philosophy, but by climate. And yet, for all we've uncovered about these homes, one question from the beginning of our journey still remains unanswered. A mystery buried just beneath the surface. For centuries, scholars looked at turf houses and saw something crude, temporary, improvised. A last resort shelter for people who lacked timber, tools, and options. But modern science has rewritten that assumption. Thermographic imaging showed that turf walls don't just hold heat, they regulate it, releasing warmth slowly through the night like natural insulation panels. Soil analysis revealed layered turf bricks working as organic composites, roots binding the structure, air pockets trapping heat, moisture stabilizing temperature. And when researchers built full-scale reconstructions, the results were astonishing. A properly crafted turf house could outperform many early modern European wooden homes in both insulation and stormproofing. Architects took notice. Environmental engineers did too. Some now call these structures proto-earthships, early examples of homes that fuse soil, climate, and architecture into a single system. Others see them as among the world's first passive heating designs, buildings that cooperate with nature rather than fight it. But the real secret buried in these walls isn't just technical brilliance, it is foresight. The Vikings weren't simply building for the climate they lived in, they were building for the climate they sensed was coming. The true brilliance of turf houses lies in a quiet truth. By the late 1100s, the North Atlantic was already drifting toward what we now call the Little Ice Age. A long, grinding period of colder winters, violent storms, and shortened growing seasons. Yet, centuries before the cold fully arrived, Icelandic settlers were constructing homes that seemed almost prophetic in their design. Deeply insulated, storm-resistant, half buried in the earth like animals bracing for a harder world. How did they know? Were they guided by ancestral memory from Arctic Norway, where generations had learned to read the wind and soil like scripture? Did they sense subtle changes in the land, a shift in the ice, a tightening of the seasons that modern people would overlook? Or was it simply the oldest instinct our species possesses, the ability to survive by preparing for conditions harsher than the present? Whatever the reason, one truth endures. These were not just houses, they were predictions structures carved from earth to outlast storms that had not yet arrived, built to endure a future no one had witnessed. And astonishingly, many of them did. The Vikings who settled Iceland weren't just warriors or explorers, they were engineers reading climate, soil, wind, and survival the way others read scripture. Their turf houses remind us of something we often forget. Humanity's oldest strength is not conquest, it is adaptation. When the world changes, whether by fire, ice, or time, it is always the people who listen to the land who last the longest. If you want to continue exploring how ancient humans built, lived, and endured in ways we've only begun to understand, join us here on Prehistoric Shadows, where the past is not dead, it's only buried, waiting for us to uncover it.